Hello and welcome to this morning's coffee conversation at the Hugh Lane Gallery, Dublin. My name is Michelle Hall, I'm a member of the Gallery's Artist Panel and today I'll be speaking to you about the artist Rita Dunna from the starting point of her work, Newsprint, in the permanent collection of the Gallery, just one of a large body of work spanning many years when the artist was influenced by and responded to the political situation of Northern Ireland in the 70s and 80s. On our way to looking at this artwork, let's begin with some background information on the artist. Rita Dunna was born in 1939 to an Irish mother and Anglo-Irish father in Wedsbury, Staffordshire, and grew up in an area known as the Black Country in the West Midlands of England, just north of Birmingham. It's an area that Dunna has turned to as subject matter in her later works, an area which holds great significance as the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, earning its name from its high level of air pollution due to its coal mines, iron foundries, glass factories and steel mills. It's said that the town of Wedsbury had the largest Irish population in the Black Country after Wolverhampton, with the journalist Hugh Heinrich estimating in 1872 that there was a population of at least 3,000 Irish living there. Among the literary figures to have written about the Black Country was Charles Dickens, who wrote that, quote, tall chimneys crowding on each other and presenting that endless repetition of the same dull, ugly form poured out their plague of smoke, obscured the light and made foul the melancholy air, end quote. Writer Francis Brett Young adds, quote, to the north, the Black Country smouldered beneath its perpetual smoke pole, end quote. Dunna was interested in art from an early age and it's speculated that the style of technical drawing evident in her work was due in part to the influence of her father, who was a toolmaker. Her first art education experience took place in her late teens when she studied life drawing at the Bilston College of Further Education, not far from her hometown. From there, she went on to study fine art from 1956 to 1962 at the University of Durham in Newcastle in the northeast of England, where she began to formulate a drawing style that embodied a tension between figurative representation and the abstract. As we will see in later works, she became less interested in the figure as direct subject matter, instead referring to it in more abstract ways, but at different points in her work, we see some examples of self-portraiture. As well as being a practicing artist, Dunna's role as art educator was a significant part of her artistic career. Her print titled Slade of 1980 was made during her time working at the Slade School of Art in London and is one of her few works that is concerned with a more feminist leaning subject matter and her lesser known interests in the role of women as artists. In the permanent collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum London, Slade is currently on display at v a South Kensington in their prints and drawings study rooms. It is a limited edition colour etching and photogravure, a type of photographic etching that she made as an homage to the wonderful etching studio at the Slade School, commemorating her experience of working there. From the v a website, quote, on her first morning there, she was shown up to the life drawing studio the assumption being in the early 70s that she was there to start work as a life model, not as a teacher, end quote. In the work, Dunna depicts herself in a pose of painting, but instead of including a mall stick, the tool traditionally used to support the painting arm, we see her using her own left arm in a statement of her strength as a self-supporting female artist and creating an image that depicts the absence of traditional tools which may also represent the dominant male canon. From the v &A web description, quote, her fingers appear to magically conjure colour out of a space otherwise occupied by a grid of organisational lines, an unrelenting repetition of squares and right angles. While assuming the pose of a sexually desirable woman, at the same time she asserts her independence through lack of material support, the mall stick. The hair shielding the body evokes a Godiva-like determination to achieve what she has set out to do by sheer ingenuity in the face of all the sexual political odds." End quote. Dunna often uses a repetition of imagery, words and titles within her work, 
1994, she created another work titled Slade, this time a self-portrait oil painting. Here, the painting is shown in a photographic portrait of Dunna taken by the British photographer Nicholas Sinclair in 1999. This photograph is in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery London and was exhibited in their 2001-2002 exhibition, Contemporary Women Artists, which coincided with the exhibition Mirror Mirror, a collection of self-portrait works by 40 female artists spanning four decades from the mid 17th century to present day. In this image, we see the artist standing in front of and in close quarters to her life-size self-portrait painting. It is the artist's gaze in the painting that stares directly at and addresses the viewer, again in a powerful stance of artist at work. Cleverly composed, we can see the artist's hands placed right up beside her painted left hand, almost merging as one. The bodily tools of her creativity hold the physical tools of her practice, a paintbrush and palette. Unlike the earlier Slade work, here a painter's cloak now covers the body of the artist. This painting was first shown in Dunna's solo show of 1995 at the Camden Art Centre, simply titled Paintings and Drawings, and is described as showing Dunna's reflective strength as an artist. In 2005, Birmingham's Icon Gallery showed the most comprehensive exhibition to date of Dunna's work and described the self-portrait as one of a number of works that dealt with the predicament of being a female artist in a male-dominated art world. Quote, the artist depicts herself draped in a one-piece garment. Her right hand holds a mall stick defensively across her face. Her left bears an empty artist's palette as though it were a shield, end quote. In this piece, we see the artist reintroduce and present a powerful new ownership of the art-making tools left out of the earlier Slade work. By 1970, Donna was teaching at the Fine Art Department of Reading University. From the mid 60s on, students in the USA and around the world were instigating protests against the Vietnam War with a counterculture movement rising up to oppose the war, to challenge the values of mainstream American culture, capitalism and societal norms. On May 4th, 1970, a date surrounded by regular student protest and political events relating to the progression of the Vietnam War, the Kent State University massacre took place. In an effort to curb student dissent in the preceding days, the Ohio National Guard had been deployed to the university campus. In the face of escalating protest and students' refusal to stand down, the guards opened fire and four students were killed. The events of that day had wide ranging consequences in America, with millions of students around the country protesting what had happened. In England, the students of Dunna gathered to respond to the events at Kent State through a series of collaborative explorations, experimenting with performance and installation inspired by the Fluxus art movement happenings that were marking the beginnings of performance art. The group occupied a studio at the university to stage events and collective actions. Didactic conventions and context were replaced in an attempt to diagram a charged collective knowledge. Donna later responded to this experience in her work, Reflections on Three Weeks in May 1970, made in 1971 and acquired by Tate Britain in 1972. This work marked a significant shift in her practice and was the starting point for the development of the style and content of her output for years to come. It used a unique social political cartography to plot distinct events between image and experience and brought a concern for current affairs to her artistic motivations. From here, she would begin to take a radically political stance in the creation of her artworks. The following is a series of excerpts from the Tate Gallery Report 1972 to 1974 published in London 1975 and is based on a conversation with the artist in May 1974. Quote, Reflections on Three Weeks in May 1970 was painted in the first studio she had had. She recalled the sense of liberation she felt at that time, knowing that she had somewhere to work and something to say. Before the 1972 John Murr's exhibition, where this picture won a prize and led to her first solo show at Nigel Greenwood's gallery, she had worked in complete isolation. Painting was an internal thing, entirely private. 
she considered herself a teacher rather than an artist. Many of the student group had been profoundly affected by the 1968 student demonstrations and were concerned, as she was herself, to find a way to break through the conventional approach, not simply to seek acceptable solutions in terms of conventional drawing and painting. On the first day in the studio, it was painted white throughout, including the floor. A student devised a grid as a means of regulating movement within the space. Crosses were put on the grid to mark squares where movement was prohibited. The studio became a stage, action, performance being a natural expression of group activity. The events of those three weeks proved very important for her work. And looking back, she found she could focus on them very clearly. She said that they affected all the participants in terms of one's own identity and also as to what one regarded as the function of art. The activities of the three weeks in May helped her understand the potential in painting and she feels that in some ways she has still not entirely absorbed these lessons. In making a painting on the subject, she was able to treat it in a way that was basically abstract, but at the same time contained an important emphasis on content. The subject matter was something she was intimately concerned with, yet could at the same time distance herself from. She had a personal response to the situation, but it was significant in a wider, more collective way because it was shared with others. It was not something done in isolation. She is intensely conscious of the way painting can isolate the artist and that one of the strengths of teaching is that it can counteract this. Although committed to working within the limitations of a flat surface, she had been impressed by Boyce's statement that it was no longer possible to work alone. It seemed to fit in with her own point of view. Indeed, she found it enormously exciting to participate with others on a creative level, and in doing so, came to see that painting could be part of a much larger whole. Her main interest in the activity that took place during the three weeks was in the nature of the space and the way it was changed by the participants. In the painting, space, time and reference to events are brought together on various levels in various ways. The artist stated, I hope that by using abstract signs and conventions of perspective to find equivalents for experience and feeling, while at the same time conveying precise information about a particular time and place. I also wanted to investigate the extent to which a painting could encompass those multidimensional events and relationships, add a new element, contribute another part to the whole. The central rectangle of the picture represents the plan of the studio and is covered by a grid of squares which corresponds to the actual grid drawn on the floor. The crosses relate to the actual crosses on the floor marking taboo areas. The system was that a cross was marked every sixth square. However, in one case, the student doing the crosses made a mistake. And here on the right hand of the picture, the square contains a dotted cross to represent a square called into question. The pinkish shape represents a blood stain, a symbol with multiple references. It refers to the killing of four students at Kent State and also when one of the most politically concerned students worked with blood for a performance piece before an audience which involved entrails all over the floor. The artist felt the need to incorporate the sense of a stain as something left behind, a reference to time. In terms of the way it is painted, the bloodstain is the only thing in the room which is visually on the level of reality. It is pink, it looks like blood, it's the only point where the inner and outer worlds meet. In general, the painting is concerned with the way in which fact can be rendered into the abstract language of painting. Preliminary drawings are essential to the artist's work, since to work out the different perspective in such a painting is extremely complicated. Numerous studies for it include a drawing which establishes the precise shape of the bloodstain in outline and perspective, and also incorporates a photographic image of the room with a cross on the floor and a reference to the model draped in a sheet who does not, however, figure in the final picture." End quote. More recently, one of these preliminary sketches, Drawing for Reflection on Three Weeks in May 1970, Bloodstains, was auctioned in 2016, with a guiding estimate of four to six thousand pounds and ended up fetching a total of thirty thousand pounds. 
Learning much from this artwork and Donna's experience in 1971, we move into the next significant stage of her, her output. By this time, Donna was in a relationship with the artist Richard Hamilton, later to marry in 1991. Hamilton was a key figure in the pop art movement in Britain, and they are pictured here in their early relationship, photographed by William Katz with Hamilton's own Polaroid camera. Donna can be seen here to wear badges supporting various civil rights causes that the couple held a concern for throughout their life. Due in part to her Irish heritage, Donna's attention now turned to the events taking place in Northern Ireland, and she would remain committed to this exploration for many years to come. From the VNA website, quote, Rita Donna is well known for her commentaries on Northern Ireland in a number of works which employ the concept of mapping and territorial organisation, frequently pinpointing particularly horrific events in the region's recent history, end quote. Through looking at reflections on three weeks in May 1970, we learned of this crucial period of development and expansion for the artist. Her work began to merge cartographic qualities with sensibilities of conceptual and minimal art. Michael Bracewell wrote in 2006 that, quote, she confounds the usual periodic table of art historical movements and sensibilities, end quote. As we move into these works responding to the conditions of Northern Ireland, we see the introduction of collage and the use of print media, both formally and in a channeling of the conceptual qualities of these mediums. Her use of these materials is also a reminder of the early days of collage in which text and newsprint was first used as a fine art material. In a description of after the Talbot Street Blast of 1974 from Radical Art in 1970s Britain by John A. Walker, quote, the subject concerns the male victim of a car bomb explosion in Talbot Street, Dublin on the 17th of May, 1974, whose body lying on the pavement was covered by the evening newspapers. Donna's starting point was mass media imagery and the painting's content also featured one type of mass media, the press. Newspapers cover the body and hide it from you. Newspapers also cover stories often in a brutal or sensational manner that hides the personal tragedy of the individuals involved. While Donna was moved by the deaths reported in the press, her pictorial response was remarkably restrained. No blood or guts, no vehement brushstrokes, no angry denunciations or partisan demands for political action." End quote. And from the Hugh Lane Gallery worksheet accompanying the 2011 show Civil Rights Etc, an exhibition showing the work of Donna alongside Richard Hamilton in what would be his final exhibition before his death later that year, quote, In pursuit of subtlety rather than sensationalism, Donna departs from traditional modes of representing violence, offering instead a refined aesthetic and an entirely new perspective. Without trivialising the tragedy, Donna distances herself from the specificities of the actual event. After the Talbot Street Blast features an indistinct outline of a human form enveloped by a newspaper, juxtaposed with a collage of the same image composed of newprint. Critical of the media's exploitative use of tragedy, Donna uses an unconventional approach in the representation of a violent event to call attention to the type of society the mass media has produced. She suggests that today's public, inundated with traumatic images, have become indifferent, in part because the press often conceal the true source of tragedy in their pursuit of sensationalism. The newspapers in this work disguise the figure's identity, the news literally and figuratively covering up the devastating effects of the event on the individuals involved. Donna deliberately leaves the narrative incomplete in an acknowledgement of the difficulty the impossibility, perhaps, of ever adequately representing such tragedy." End quote. In evening newspapers of the same year, we see her technique expand with a precise and delicate linear technique combined with print media, including the use of letter set, a material more typically used for typeface design, along with thin, pale washes of greys and whites. Here she employs a common technique of her work, the repetition and reinterpretation of imagery, as we see the newspaper motif of after the Talbot Street Blast inverted and further explored. 
This is again brought into the artwork newsprint, where we see this motif reshaped and set atop a saturation of Irish themed newspaper material. The headlines bring us away from reports of disruption and take a promotional turn. We see the symbol of Irish tourism in the headline, The Reasons to Come to Ireland, with a string of gradually emptying Guinness glasses mapped across the top. The collage sits on top of an ominous looking pencil drawing in the background, like a storm cloud or the smoke from a bomb blast. This artwork is donated by the artist to the collection of the Hewlin Gallery and was chosen by Dunnett and Hamilton as the cover image for the accompanying catalogue to their 2011 exhibition, Civil Rights, etc. Scale is also important to note here, with each of these works measuring in the region of one metre in width. As in our earlier works, absence is as important as what is included. We don't see the figure itself, but a trace of it through the mapping of the body with the shape and form of the newspaper cut out. As Dunne's work develops into the 1980s, we see a more explicit inclusion of cartographic tropes. The artist uses drawing and painting to make interventions on the mapped landscape and to create a repeat motif of the outline of the Northern Irish border and coastline in the series Shadow of the Six Counties. In this first piece, we see the outline shape of the North used to zone in on the area of Belfast and its surroundings and painted directly onto the map of the region. The artist quoted in the accompanying catalogue of her Icon Gallery exhibition of 2005 states, drawn as I had been by my involvement in the depiction of an innocent victim of a bomb blast, in confrontation with the fact of the British presence in Ulster, the shape of the six counties began to haunt my imagination. Drawn and redrawn, it came to fix itself on my mind. An image of topographic beauty, altogether at odds with the fate the province had been assigned in the United Kingdom as the arena of violence and death. The shadow referred to in the title of the works in this series alludes to the impact of the violent struggles over the geopolitical status of Northern Ireland that began in the late 60s and is widely considered to have concluded in the late 90s. In 2005, the curator Jonathan Watkins described how the series addresses the shifting territorial form of the country. Donna pushes and pulls at it. She draws an actual map superimposing differences of scale, applying various layers of paint, and yet the shadow still comes through with all its recognizable contours, outlines of natural features and man-made frontiers." End quote. In another of the series from 1981, and now in the collection of the Imperial War Museum, we see the shape of the six counties repeated, overlaid and built up, creating this confusing array of borders and territories, with the use of colour adding a sense of foreboding. Sitting on top of this, we clearly see the mapped outline of the H-block of the Mays prison where political prisoners were held, most famously the hunger strikers of the early 1980s. This aerial view and blueprint style motif would be repeated in many of Dunna's work, and notably here in Long Meadow of 1982, as the Mays prison was earlier known. A large oil painting measuring 1.5 metres square, it depicts, quote, the eight prison H-blocks projected by Dunna in perspective onto a square canvas, echoing the square plan of a single cell block. The aerial view and the subtle rendering of the light convey the feeling of an air raid, end quote. In exploring the contested geography of Northern Ireland, Sarat Maharaj argued Dunna's work as a kind of ethical cartography, quote, she draws us into examining the pros and cons of representation, of mulling over the choices and dilemmas involved in mapping the world, a search for new perspectives on Ireland beyond worn out fixed ways of understanding it. Her emphasis falls on the search for critical awareness on how meanings are made, rubbed out and revised, end quote. Rita Dunna is now 81 years old and her work continues to be exhibited regularly. Her H Blocks works were included in the 2016 Art Angel project Inside Artists and Writers in Reading Prison. Another work is included in the current exhibition Democracies at Tate Liverpool and in 2020 her work was shown at the exhibition 60 Years at Tate Britain celebrating the work of female artists since 1960. 
Her long legacy of engagement with an artistic investigation of the Northern Irish situation places her as an important figure among the many artists who have tended to this subject matter throughout their careers. This concludes our coffee conversation for today. Many thanks for joining us. For further information about Hugh Lane Gallery programmes, please visit hughlane.ie forward slash education. Thank you.